go ahead and get going. Let's take a look at what we got in Buzz today. Oh, let me talk about before we get to the end of that. Uh, before we get to the end, end of Buzz, we've got this week and next week. That, that, that's really it. And then finals the week after that. So we, and our final. Let's see. I got the schedule. This is posted in Google Classroom. I got the final schedule. Just print out a copy to look at. Uh, let's see. This is zero B R finals. Not till Friday. So the last day of school before the break. Friday at this time, 7.15. So we'll come to class on Friday, and then I will open the final. So it, it's not available until class on Friday. And so you'll have an hour and 55 minutes, 7.15 to 9.10 officially, to have the 0B exam. And it'll be followed by the second period exam. So your second period class will be at 9.15 to 11.10. And so that's the last two finals that we have. So we're, we're on Friday. So, and, and no, I don't know what we're doing Monday and Tuesday that week yet. I got to talk about it in our Thursday meeting this week and say, what, what are we doing? Because I'm not going to have a new assignment that week because we got the final, you know. So we're going to have an assignment this week, we'll have an assignment next week, but uh, we'll just have the final. So we might do some kind of review or something. I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll have to look at it, uh, figure out what to do when we get there. All right. Now, let's get this up on the screen. All right, let's see. Go to our grade screen as usual. Scroll way down to the bottom because we're almost finished. This week, graphing exponential functions. And next week, we're graphing logarithmic functions. So we've got a couple of graphing lessons to finish out the semester here. And then that semester exam on a Friday, December 20th. So... There we go. We'll take a look at 406 this week, 407 next week. Um, so let's get to it here. 406, 406. There we go. Graphing exponential functions lesson. Oh, that's right. Waklaw Serpinski. Waklaw. You don't see that name much. There you go. There. If you need a name for a child later on, consider Waklaw. Waklaw. He was a Polish mathematician back during World War I who did work with fractals. Fractals is using shapes that are all like repetitive. Um, a fractal is a geometric figure divided into pieces which are similar in shape, but smaller than the original. So that's what a fractal is. But he invented and created the Serpinski triangle. Oh, and here we have the correct pronunciation of Serpinski. Here, let's listen to that. Serpinski. Serpinski. He says it with a little flair there. Serpinski. Serpinski. So, have you ever seen a Serpinski triangle? Well, we have one right here. This is this is a, a pretty interesting thing, the Serpinski triangle. So, if you you can get into fields of mathematics that are really very different than just playing with numbers, because this is this is the Serpinski triangle. One method of creating the triangle is by first drawing an equilateral triangle. Remove another, smaller equilateral triangle from inside the original. The vertices of the removed triangle meet at the midpoints of each segment of the larger triangle. Okay, so notice what he said there. The way they removed that triangle in the middle is they went to the midpoint. That's the very middle of each side. They took the middle of each side and removed the triangle that's created by connecting those which left three other triangles that are exactly the same size by removing the one from the middle. Next, three more equilateral triangles are removed from inside each of the remaining three triangles. The process of removing triangles inscribed within the larger triangle can continue forever. So that is the Serpinski triangle, and they just keep going and going and going and taking more and more and more. And, you know, at some point we can't really see it because it's so small. But in theory, we know that you can continue infinitely doing that because even though it gets small and small and small, it still exists. All right. So after completing this lesson, we're going to be able to answer these questions. Why does the average rate of change vary on an exponential function? 
What effects does adding a constant have to an exponential function? So we're looking at translations, transformations. How can exponential functions be utilized to fit existing data? All right, so Sierpinski's triangle actually demonstrates an exponential function. So an exponential function is a function where the variable is in the exponent. And the base is a positive real number not equal to 1. Because 1 to the x is just a line. Because it always equals 1. So it has to be a number. And it has to be a positive real number. So the base is a positive number. We don't do negative numbers in an exponential function. So the exponential function that's used in Sierpinski's triangles, f of x equals 3 raised to the x power where X is the stage at which you're removing triangles. So we're going to see a video that kind of illustrates how is Sierpinski's triangle related to this exponential function. The exponential function is F of X equals 3 to the X. At stage 0, when X equals 0, the function equals 1. indicating there is only one solid triangle. This is how the fractal begins. At stage 1, f of x has a value of 3. This means that the first time a triangle is removed from the center, there are three triangles left. At the second stage, f of x has a value of 9. So 9 triangles remain. At stage 3, f of x has a value of 27. So the third time equilateral triangles are removed, 27 triangles are left, and so on. And so on. So yeah, so it really is a, an illustration, a visual illustration of 3 to the x power. So it says, let's graph the exponential function demonstrated in Sierpinski's triangle. And look, they've got it wrong here because that's supposed to be an exponent. It's not 3x. Using technology. So when they graph it, it looks very much like this. Right, uh, these negatives don't really, that's not part of the Sierpinski triangle, but that is how the function three to the X goes. But right here at zero, when X is zero, you just have one triangle. And then on the first stage, it's up at three. And on the second stage, it's up here at nine, because three squared is nine. And by the third one, it's way off the graph up there at 27. So graphing the exponential function, Set up your coordinate plane. You can see that the grid all there. Type in f of x equals 3 to the x power. And then you should see it. There. And we know how to do that in Desmos. So we'll do it. So the domain of this function is all real numbers, right? The function itself, it goes forever to infinity to the left. And that goes forever to infinity to the right. Although it gets big really, really fast. It'll continue on and on and on and on. But what is the range? So the range is the y value. So if we look at that again. We can see that there are no negative y's. There's no negative y's in the range of an exponential function like this, unless we translate it or something. But for this function, and it actually never hits zero. It just gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to zero, but it'll never get to zero. So the range is y is greater than zero. Not greater than or equal to, because it's never equal to, just y is greater than zero. All right. Oh, what do they want us to look at there? Oh, okay. So they were just kind of illustrating it. Let's say when x equals negative one, right? So we're talking about this part of the graph right here, where it's starting to go towards zero. Uh, three to the negative one power, we remember from our exponent rules that we can make that a positive exponent by moving it into the denominator. So that's really one over three to the first power or one third. So when X is negative one, the Y is one third. And as we continue on down here to X to the negative five, three to the negative fifth power, 
we rewrite as one over three to the fifth. So it's one over 243. That's what three to the fifth is. And while one over 243 is a very small number, it's not zero. So let's extrapolate and continue on to say, now let's say X is negative 500. So we've gone on this graph way down four screens over. We're at negative 500. If we looked at the math, three raised to the power of negative 500 would be the same as one over three to the 500th power, which would be an awfully huge number. I'm not even sure our calculator would like that without putting in scientific notation. But one divided by three to the 500th power is still not zero. It's a really, 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 really small number. It's got a lot of zeros after the decimal, 0. 0.0000. There's a lot of zeros out there, but it's not equal to zero. So it'll never get to zero. It'll just get really, really closer and closer and closer. Okay. So those imaginary lines that approaches like that, like y equals zero, are called asymptotes. That's a word you've heard before. Asymptotes. So it's approaching a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So we have this little illustration here. And let's look at exponential functions in general here. So if we have a base greater than one, like we were just looking at three to the x power, three is the base. Okay. It's going to look like this in general. This is a base of one and a half. That's one and a half raised to the power of x. We can change that to two. We can change that to two and a half or three or three and a half or four or four and a half. Or four. And you see what's happening. The bigger the base gets, the steeper it's getting. Now, in, in these all go through a y-intercept of one because it doesn't matter what the base is. If you take it to the power of zero, which is what x is on the y-intercept, it's going to equal one. Five to the zero power is one. Four and a half to the zero power is one even though they don't really show it on the line. Their, their graph isn't that accurate. You know, four is, is, is one. Oh, it's one. See, that didn't show it either, but it looks like it's up here. It's not. It should be at one. But just know the effect it has. The larger the base, the steeper it gets very quickly because, you know, five squared would be a lot bigger number than two squared. So we can understand that it's going to get steep very fast. Now, let's talk about if our base is smaller than one. Now, we said it has to be a positive base. So we don't look at negative bases. So if it's less than one, well, if it's zero, we just have a straight line. And notice it doesn't go into the negatives at all. Because if you have zero taken to a negative power, if X is negative one, that means we have to move it down into the denominator and we can't have a zero in the denominator. So that's why that stops if you graph just zero. But it's not an exponential equation if the base is zero. But if let's let's move it up a little bit. Point one. Notice this is just the opposite of what we we're looking at just a minute ago. Now it's going up to infinity on the negative x's. Point two, point three. Look what happens as our base gets closer and closer to one. Oh, it flattens out. Now, if our base is one, one to the x, that's not an exponential equation, right? That's linear because one raised to any power is one. So it's just a straight line. So if we have a base of one, that's not exponential, that's linear. But anything below one is going to be coming down from the left side and getting closer to that asymptote on the right, where when we have greater than one, it's just the opposite. The asymptote is on the left and it's going up towards infinity. Now let's do uh, something kind of fun here. Let's, let's do one half and two. These are actually mirror reflections of each other. If they graph them right. Uh, let's... That didn't graph. Let's do one fifth and five. Let's see if that looks a little closer. Nah, their graph is still not very accurate because those are not the same, but it should be a mirror reflection. All right. We'll use Desmos here in just a moment, make it more accurate. All right. So it wants us to think about it. 
Point move the point on slider B. When the base of an exponential function is greater than one, right? Greater than one, describe the graph. All right. Well, we can describe it as the larger the base, the steeper it gets. See what they're saying. Reading the graph from left to right, as the x coordinates increase, the y coordinates also increase. And as the base of the function increases, the slope gets steeper. That's what we're saying. As the base increases, the number gets bigger. The domain is all real numbers. The range is y is greater than zero because there's a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. And that's true for no matter what the base is here. All right, what's the next question? Uncheck the box labeled base greater than one. Okay. And check the box labeled base between zero and one. Move the slider and then describe how the graph of an exponential function when the base is between zero and one. And how do these compare to the base greater than one? Okay, so we did that. We looked at that. And we saw that we have the closer it is to one, the less the slope, the wider it is, right? And the closer it is to zero, the steeper the slope. It starts up at infinity and approaches the y equals zero asymptote to the right. So it has, again, a domain of all numbers and a range of y is greater than zero. So as the x-coordinates increase on the graphs with each exponential function with a base between zero and one, the y-coordinates decrease because it's coming down. And as the base of the function increases or gets closer to one, the slope of the graph becomes flatter. All of these have a domain of all real numbers and the range is y is greater than zero. All right, what happens to the graph when the base is zero? Yeah, we looked at that. We said if we take it back to zero, it's just a linear equation that starts at zero and goes to infinity. The graph is a ray on the x-axis from the origin going to the right. Remember that zero raised to any positive exponent is going to be zero, so it's just a line. When zero is raised to a negative exponent, the base becomes a fraction with zero in the denominator. We talked about that, like zero to the negative three is one over zero to the third, and that cannot exist because zero in the denominator is a problem there. So we know what that is. And then the last one it has, last question, what happens to the graph is base is one. And we talked about that one raised to any power is one. So it's going to continue to be just a straight line. F of X equals one. One to any power equals one. All right. Page two. That's a lot for page one. Okay, we have another video where we're going to look at the math part of exponential equations and how they can be affected by coefficients and what the numbers mean inside the base there when the base is larger or smaller than one. So it's three and a half minutes. Today I'm going to show you how to use the properties of exponents to interpret exponential functions. In this particular set of examples, I'm going to be referring to the value of boats. I have boat one, two, and three. So beginning with boat one, the very first number you're going to see is 5,000. This is the initial value of the boat. The next thing you're going to notice is being multiplied by 1.25. This is our percent of change. What is happening to that initial value? And then our exponent of x is where we would put our numbers of years. So if I wanted to know how much this boat would be worth in 10 years, I would replace this x with 10 and then evaluate this. So what else can I tell about boat 1? Well, we know, like we said, the initial value is 5,000, but it's being multiplied by 1.25. What does that tell us in terms of percentage? The number is greater than one, so it is keeping its value, but it is gaining 25% in value. So if I were to classify this, I would say that it is increasing. So boat number one actually is increasing its value year after year by 25%. Now looking at boat two, same thing. Notice we have the initial value first, it is a value of $4,000. Here our percent is 0 0.40, our percent of change, and we have the x for our number of years. Now the difference between these two you'll see is that this one is greater than one, and boat two is less than one. So what does that mean? 
it means that we're going to keep 40% of our initial value. So we know our percentages go up to 100. So if I keep 40, that's also saying that I lost 60. So if I'm classifying this one, I would say it's decreasing. I'm actually losing 60% of the value because I'm keeping 40%. So when I'm looking at boat three, I have it just in words, but not in the expression. So how can we make that happen? Here we have an initial value of 4,500. The same as we have with boats one and two at our initial value. Then we're multiplying by our percent of change. So here it says it's losing 50% each year. So if we are losing 50%, that means we are keeping 50%, expressed as 0 0.50. And then the last thing we add is our x, which is our number of years. So we can easily determine by the way it is written here, our percent of change is less than 1, so we know it's decreasing. And of course, our problem actually says it loses. So we would say it is decreasing. Now, when you look at these two, we have 4,000 times 0 0.40 and 4,500 times 0 0.50. A lot of times we tend to think, oh, well, this is decreasing by a lot less because it is 0 0.40. But really, notice we are keeping 40%, meaning that we are losing 60%, as opposed to here, we are losing 50%. So if you were comparing these two boats, this one is losing value at a much faster rate than boat number three. So knowing what these numbers mean and knowing how to classify them as increasing and decreasing be very helpful in interpreting these functions. And that is how you use the properties of exponents to interpret exponential functions. Okay. And, and if you think about what the graph looks like, when we were just looking at the graph, if the base was greater than one, it was increasing, right? And, and the larger it is, the faster it's increasing. So it does not surprise us to know that the value of this boat is increasing because we understand exponentials when the base is greater than one, the graph shows it increasing. And when the base is less than one, which these are 0.4 and 0.5, we saw it going down, right? So we understand that the value of these two boats are going to go down just because of what we saw with the exponential graphs. All right, so we're gonna look at the key features of exponential graphs. So it's important to know uh, key features of different functions when we compare the graphs. So here's some for exponentials. So, so the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is always found when the x value is equal to zero. That's for any equation, exponential, quadratic, any polynomial, anything. And since these are exponential functions, any base taken to the zero power is equal to one. So you're going to have a y-intercept of 1 unless there's a transformation, unless we have a coefficient or something that moves the graph, right? And then the end behavior. So this is classifying the extreme ends. Does the right end rise up to infinity or does the right end get closer and closer to an asymptote? So that's what we're going to look at. So for this discussion, we're going to use a to the x equals p, which would be the starting amount, the principal, whatever the original amount, base raised to the x power plus k. All right, so if p is positive, if b, if the base is larger than one, this is going to be a growth function. So let's let's just do a base larger than one. So let's say f of x equals base larger than one. So let's do two raised to the power of X, right? That's an increasing function as it goes, because we know when the base is larger than one, it's going to increase as it goes to the right. And this is if P is a positive number, let's put a P out there. Let's give it, let's give it a coefficient out front. Let's just say we have a coefficient of four. This is a positive P. Now notice it changed our y-intercept because it multiplied the one times four. This becomes our y-intercept because we know that whenever X is zero, whatever's in parentheses is gonna be one. Doesn't matter what the base is. So the coefficient becomes the new y-intercept, but it's increasing because P is a positive number. And when B is less than one, we know it's gonna be decreased. If we make that point two instead of two, 
still keeps that y-intercept at four, but now it's a decreasing function. It's a decreasing function. Okay, so that's a decay function. Now let's talk about what happens when P, that number out front, that coefficient, is a negative number. All right, let's go back and make this a base larger than one because that's what we're looking for first, base larger than one. But instead of a four, we're going to make this a negative four. When this coefficient is a negative out front, it basically reflects it over the x-axis. It's the exact same graph. It just goes down instead of up. Instead of going up through four, oh, not equals. It goes down through negative four. It still has the same asymptote to the left. It's still approaching y equals zero. Still doesn't touch it. It just gets closer and closer and closer. But it just reflects it downward. And what happens over here if b is less than one? Point two, now it's actually increasing, but it's coming from the negative infinity. Remember, when it was a positive coefficient, it was decreasing. Now that it's a negative coefficient, it's increasing, but it still has the exact same asymptote. It's still going close to y equals zero, approaching that. It's just reflected down over the x-axis. All right, it wants us to describe the y-intercept and in end behavior of the following graph. So this is something that when dealing with exponents, can we understand what we see on the graph? So on this, the y-intercept, negative one. What's the end behaviors? On the left side, it continues up to infinity. But as x increases, as x gets bigger, it's approaching an asymptote at y equals negative 2. y equals negative 2. So obviously this is a base that is smaller than 1 because it's decreasing. But we've translated it down. What does that look like? Let's, let's talk about that. Break. So there's a base smaller than 1, 0.2. How did it get to where it had an asymptote down here? It's a translation. If we just subtract 2 on the end... That's that k value, negative 2. Look, now we have an y-intercept of negative 1, and it approaches negative 2, because this is a translation up and down. When you put a number on the end, just like we did with quadratics, just like we did with any other polynomial, when you put a number on the end, plus or minus, it'll raise it up or down based on that number. So these work exactly the same. The translation works exactly the same as it did with all the other functions we've looked at. Check your work. The y-intercept is 0, negative 1. Graph starts up on the left, goes downward and close to y, negative 2 on the right. All right, example 2. Find the average rate of change. Ooh, this is interesting. For this equation, 3 times 4 to the x. So let's do this. 3 times 4 to the x. Okay, here's our exponential function. The y-intercepts at 3 because that's our coefficient out front. But they want us to find the average rate of change from x equals 1 to x equals 3. Well, what is it at 1? Well, it is 12. So let's put that point on there. And at 3, this is going to be way up there. I don't know if I can... Show this on the graph. We'll get up there high enough. Let's see. Are we to three yet? No. Oh, three is right here. Three, 192. Three, 192. There's that point there. So we got 112 and three, 192. Too bad enough here to see both of those points. And it wants to know the average rate of change between those two. So there's two ways to do that. One, we can graph it and see what they're equal to. They're equal to 12 when it's at 1. It's equal to 192 when it's at 3. Or you can just do the math. You can make this an exponent of 1, 4 to the first power times 3. Well, 4 to the first power is 4 times 3. We knew that would be 12. Or we can put the 3 in there. So 4 to the third power is 64. 64 times 3 is 192. 
and we have our rate of change formula. But once we find out what those values are, remember slope formula, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1, set it up as a fraction, 192 minus 12, 3 minus 1. So the average rate of change is 90. You could also do that as rise over run, but you got to count up 180 spaces and it only runs two, 180 over two. It's rise over run on a graph, right? That's the slope. Average rate of change is exactly the same as the slope. So the slope between those two lines is a slope of 90, very steep slope. But anytime you see average rate of change, just think slope. What's the slope between those two points? So the average rate of change is the amount the range values change over a given interval. So a positive average rate of change would indicate the graph is increasing. It's a positive slope. A negative one is the graph is decreasing. So here's another way to think of a slope. Look for the average rate of change. One has a job paying $9 an hour. So you can set up an equation. Y equals 9X. Y would be the amount of money he earns. X is the number of hours he works. So if he works 14 hours, Nine times 14, he makes 126 bucks. And his average rate of change be nine because for every hour he works, it, his pay increases nine. That's the average rate of change. That's the slope on what it would look like for his pay. Or you can think of it this way, a skier going down the side of a, or shushing, uh, he shushes down the side of a mountain. The skier's decrease in altitude divided by how distance horizontal distance would be his average steepness of the mountain so if he starts way up here at one two three four five six and he gets down here at where well, that's like six and a half you see that the mountain has a different steepness at different places right sometimes it's not very steep then it's steeper not very steep steeper pretty good steepness less steep but you can see what the average is by going from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain and how far is that from left to right. And we could do rise over run. Count the rise, which is a negative value, and the run and figure out what the average slope is. So even though it's got a whole bunch of different steepnesses in there, we can take an average of all of those to say this is what the slope would be. Uh, the driving distance from Tampa to Gainesville, Florida is about 140 miles. So if we look at Marisol's little map here, which if I can make that any bigger, it's any bigger. Let's look at it. So we look at this map of Marisol's trip. Well, that moves a lot. It? Okay. Starts in Tampa. And as we can see by the blue, by the blue, she's driving in the first hour, because this is the time and hours on the bottom. The first hour, she makes it 70 miles. So she's driving 70 miles an hour at the beginning of the trip. And then over the next hour, she only makes it, well, it's actually up here somewhere, but for most of the next hour, she only makes it less than 20 miles. So she might have stopped during that hour, got some fuel, got some food or something, or else she was in a school zone for an hour. I don't know. But she went really, very slow. Did not make it very far in the second hour. But then the it takes two and a half hours total. In the next half hour, she was going fast again. Probably back to the 70 miles an hour. So if we look at her actual trip, she had different speeds at different points of the trip. But we can take the rate, average rate of change to say she went two and a half hours and traveled 140 miles so we can divide 140 by 2.5 because it the rise the rise over run right went up 140 it ran 2.5 so 140 over 2.5 is 56 miles an hour her average was 56 miles an hour if she would have started and did not stop driving and drove 56 miles an hour that would have been the red line so she averaged 56 miles an hour, even though there was no point of the trip that she was actually driving 56 miles an hour, right? We just see that that's the average. That's the slope between Tampa and Gainesville. If we draw that red line, that's the slope. So when you see average rate of change, I want you to think slope, because that's what it's really just talking about. And you see there, they calculated it 
y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, 140 minus zero, two and a half minus zero, 140 over two and a half, 56 miles per hour. All right, raise that back up there. All right, and then the last thing they have here, her average rate of 56 miles per hour represents the slope between Tampa and Gainesville. Does this mean she was driving 56 miles an hour the entire time? No, she never drove that. She drove faster at times and slower at times. But, okay, page three. So up to this point, we've only worked with the general form of f of x equals b to the x power, where b is the base. So now we're going to explore how we can shift that and how the range and the asymptotes will also change with it. So if we look at an equation like a, which is the coefficient out front, here's 2. 2 is our base. We're just going to use 2 as the base. And we do x minus h and the plus k on the end. And we've done x minus h and k with other functions, quadratic and third degree, cubic and quartic functions and other things. We're going to see how it works with an exponential function. So let's change the value of, let's see, vertical. This would be the k, the plus k. If we change this number on the end, are we, wait, we need a different, we need, we need it to be an exponential equation, first of all. Uh, let's see, coefficient. Okay, coefficient of 1. So let's just give it a coefficient of one. So it doesn't change this. So really, we're just looking at two to the x power. Two to the x power has a y-intercept of one. It increases. Let's change the plus k now. If we change k to two, the only thing that happened is the entire graph shifted up two, just like we did with everything else. If we add a number on the end, it will raise or lower based on the number. If we go to negative two, negative two. It went from a y-intercept of one to a y-intercept of negative one because we lowered the entire graph by two. All right, let's put it back at zero. Let's see what happens when we change the h. Now, do you remember what happened when we used x minus h in like quadratics and other things? When, when h was a positive number, which means if h was 3, our equation would say x minus 3. It shifted the opposite way of what we thought. x minus 3 shifts right. All right, this goes to 2. Well, let's do 2. It shifted right. Instead of a y-intercept over here at 0, 1, now it's at 2, 1. And this is now a lot less than 1 because it was the point that was over here at negative 2 a minute ago. If x is a if h is a negative number, it shifts to the left because now it's x plus two. Because x is negative two, so x minus negative two shows up as x plus two in our equation. So we can go left and right by changing that h value. So let's look at that on Desmos. Let's play with that a little bit over here, where sometimes it's a little easier to see. Let's zoom back in. And let's get rid of the coefficient out front. We're just going to use 4 to the x power. If we change the x power to be a plus or minus, plus 1. Look, that, that y-intercept moved over here. Everything moved left because here's the original equation. Let's go back to our original equation so we know what we're comparing. Notice every point just shifted one left. When we change the x up here and, and add or subtract a number to it, it's shifting every single point one to the left. If we make this a negative one, it shifts it to the right now. Well, let's go negative, let's go negative three. How about that? X minus three. We can see every point is exactly three to the right of where it originally was. Okay. And then we talked about. That number on the end, plus three, every point's gone up three. Kind of hard to see over here on the right, but if we zoom in, this point that used to be right here is now up three right up here. I don't like what does all these little minor lines in here. Let's do this by ones so it's easier to see. 
So yeah, this value right here that was, uh, if we can get it right on that, 1.66998, or was just a little, there's the 166. 1298. So it went from 998 to 1298. It went up three, exactly. So every point will go up exactly three when we add a number or subtract two. Let's go down. Every point has moved down to. Now the asymptote has moved down to y equals negative two. The y intercept went from one to negative one. So all of these points change. So the translations work exactly the same as they do with everything else. You add a number on the end or put a number with the X. It'll move it either left and right with the X or up and down with the number on the end. So examples. So it says graph this using graphing technology. One third X. All right. So let's click on there. F of X equals one third. Oh, don't want the parentheses there. Third raised to the power of x. And it says this graph is a reflection over the y-axis of three to the x. So one third and three are reflections of each other. Three to the x over the y-axis. So here's the y-axis. This is a little over two. This is a little over two. If you find a point right here, negative two nine which i can't get right on there if i zoom in maybe a little bit there's negative two nine will be exactly across from two nine negative one three one three so it's a direct reflection so three of the x and then if you put it in a fraction so if this is seven to the x we could do one over seven and it's a direct reflection two one half direct reflections and there it shows both the graphs together example two uh, graph two x plus one using okay so two raised the power of x plus one turn this one off so there's two x plus one. It raises the y-intercept. All it does is, oh, well, it didn't raise the y-intercept. It, it shifted it one to the left, which raised the y-intercept because everything moved over one to the left. So it's been shifted to the left by one because we put the plus one inside the parentheses with the x in the exponent. Example three, two to the x plus one. So if we take the plus one away from the X and put it on the outside, now it raises up. It didn't shift it left because when it shifted to the left, we had the intercept down here. Let's, let's compare those. Plus one up there. See, that's the graph of two to the X plus one where it shifted it left one. This shifted it up one. The black one is shifted up one. They are different graphs. We can put the original graph on here, I guess. Oh, not X. 2 to the X. There's the original one. So, a little different. This The black one just raises it up one. The red one shifted it left one. Everything is one to the left of where it was. Where the other one is up one from where it was. And then the last example is just looking at all of them together. Just understanding how translations work. And it's exactly the same as it is with quadratics and all the other polynomials we've looked at. Page four. Fitting functions to data. All right, here's the last thing we're looking at. Let's say we've got this data. That when x was negative five, f of x was negative one. When x was negative two, it was still negative one. When x is 0, our data says it's negative 2. 1 is negative 3. 2 is 5. And we're trying to say, okay, we need to try to represent this with an equation. How can we do that? So we're going to start by actually graphing these points. 
negative five, negative one. So let's take this point and put it in negative five, negative one on our graph. See, there's negative five, negative one. The second point we had was negative two, negative one. So we're going to put this at negative two, negative one right there. So far, it's linear, right? But that's about to change. Zero, negative two. Okay, so this is going to be at zero, come here, point, negative two. One, negative three. And two, negative five. Okay, so that looks like an exponential equation. So let's see if we can find an exp exponential equation that fits that. Or if not, if we can't fit it exactly, we're looking for a line of best fit. What's the closest we can get to representing the data with an equation? So let's see. Um, we could do, it looks like it's, it's an exponential like increase that's been reflected down, right? So if our base is greater than one, Let's say a base of two, but our coefficient is a negative. Let's say a negative one. See, that makes it a down because we, we did a negative coefficient to reflect it downward. But uh, we need to bring it down one and see if that. So our K would be negative one. Oh, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. We went through the E, the D, the C. We missed the B, but we may not be able to do the B. Or the A. If we make it steeper, see, that's not going to hit it. So two is probably where, where we want to be because the steeper is, is going to miss more points. We can get the B by going to a five, but now we're missing D and E and probably every piece of data after that. So let's go back to two. Two is pretty good. Uh, we didn't really have to do the H because we if we do the H, you know, we're shifting it left and right, and that's going to get us off almost all the points. I mean, we can pick up the A and the B by shifting it way to the right, but we miss everything down here. So let's go put that at zero. So that's a pretty good fit. So we could say negative one times two to the X and then a minus one at the end. And there's more than one way to do this because if we look down here, their graph looks very much like our graph. See, we got just touching A, C, D, and E, A, C, D. But they did it with a coefficient of two, a negative two, a negative one, and a negative one. So what they did, let's see what they do. They did a positive two here and a negative two here and then shifted it one to the right to get the same graph. So there's more than one exponential equation way to do that. They went with a base of negative two, which they told us you're not supposed to do. They said, right? They said no negative bases. They said it's supposed to be positive base. So they really kind of uh, broke their own rule as far as that. That's why we did negative coefficient instead. But that's what you can play around with it. Lesson summary. We're to the end of the lesson. What's the average change? Why is the average rate of change vary? Well, it's easy to see why it varies because right here, the slope is very low. The slope's getting steeper and steeper. So the average rate of change between two points down here is going to be very small. Between two points here is going to be very big. Or, you know, It's going to vary a lot. Uh, what effects does adding a constant have to an exponential function? That's those up and down, left and right translations. And how can exponential functions be utilized to fit existing data? This talks about how to graph it. 3 to the x. And the key features is the y-intercept, n behaviors, and finding the average rate of change. And a function said to be best fit if the function passes closest to the given points. Let's look at the practice problems they give you. Uh, which function would be a best fit? So the way I would do that is I would go over to the Desmos and I would graph 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 5. You can do that on Desmos. One, two, two, three, three, five. There's the three points. And then it says, okay, which one of these would fit? 
All right, let me pick one. Two to the X plus one plus one. Two to the, I got to put these in parentheses so it keeps it all together. Oh, I didn't do two, I did X. Two to the X plus one, and then it said plus one. Two to the X plus one plus one is not a line of best fit. So that one doesn't work. How about two to the X plus one minus one? Let's try minus one. Nope, that doesn't work either. How about two to the X minus one plus one? So change this to a minus and this to a plus. Hey, that's it. It goes to all three points. So I would come back here and say, it's this one. Submit. Correct. That's that's how I would do that. Use Desmos on these things. Uh, here's another one. So you can try that one. Try each of these equations. See which ones go through these three points when you graph them on Desmos. All right, here's the other page of practice problems. Uh, graph and write a description. Okay, 4 to the x power. So if we say, okay, if I'm graphing that, 4 to the x power. Uh, it has the asymptote of y equals 0. It has a y-intercept of 1. And as the x increases, it goes up on the right towards infinity. Domain of all real numbers, a range of y is greater than 0. See how we did. This is the exponential function base four. It's steeper on the right side of the y-axis than, than exponential function base two, for example. Oh, well, we had a lot more detail than they had, so we did okay. But they have six problems for you here. I have different ones to describe and see if you can give all of that. Let's look at our assignment. We only have one lesson this week and next week. So which graph models this function? Negative two times, the, well, the way I would do that is I would say, okay, let me see f of x equals equals negative 2 to the uh, 3x right now what it was 3x negative 2 to 3x yep so let's say it's going to be this one that it's a downward exponential with a y-intercept of negative 2 oh it looks like this first one but let's check this has a y-intercept of 2. That has a y-intercept of 2. This has negative 2, but it's going the wrong direction. So, yeah, it's the first one. Given the parent function, which graph shows the parent function plus 1, which means it's just gone up 1. So pick which one of those. Uh, what are the key features of this? And if you want to graph that on Desmos, match it up. You can do that. Calculate the average rate of change from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Well, when x is 0, the graph equals negative 2. When it's 2, it's up here at 6. So rise over run from negative 2 to 6. Right here to right here. Uh, and the best fit. Again, graph those three points and then try these different equations to see which one passes through there. There you go. Not so bad. One assignment this week, one assignment next week, and then the semester final, which remember, you can exempt this class. If you have too many absences here or advisory, everything's turned in, grade 75%. You may not have to take the final. Yay. That's a wonderful thing about being seniors, being in Algebra 3, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, you get out of more stuff. All right, guys, if you've got any questions, you can hang around. Otherwise, we're really done. you got another 30 minutes before your next class. So 40 minutes, technically. Have a great week.